This week on Arizona Illustrated, a small community grapples with COVID-19. The virus has no respect for any human life. The bighorn sheep and the bighorn fire. These animals, they've survived because it's part of a natural process. Courage in the face of injustice. It wasn't necessarily the Constitution that failed me. It was the people who were placed in the responsibility of upholding the Constitution. Staying connected in the absence of presence. It's been fun to explore other means of creativity in the midst of all this. And the harbingers of summer. Sometimes they're hard to key in on what from their noise that they're making because it can be so loud, it's hard to tell where it's actually coming from. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. We're on the grounds of the El Conquistador Resort north of Tucson, which just a few weeks ago was the front line in the fight to control the Bighorn Fire. Quite literally, as it was the U.S. Forest Service's fire-related headquarters for the month of June. Well, since we are outdoors and practicing physical distancing, I come to you today with mask in hand. Arizona hit new highs in their seven-day rolling averages of new cases and experienced record coronavirus hospitalizations. At one point, the state was facing more per capita cases than any country in Europe, topping out at nearly 5,000 confirmed cases on July 2nd. Total number of cases during that time also continued to rise from just over 20,000 cases on June 1 to over 101,000 in early July. For the latest coverage focusing on coronavirus and local community resources to help you and your family to stay safe, visit news.azpm.org. Maricopa County leads the state with over 62,000 COVID-19 cases reported since February. However, the small community of Guadalupe, east of I-10 near Tempe, has a rate even higher. Tony Paniagua reports. Guadalupe is a tight-knit community of about 6,000 people of mostly Mexican or Pascuayaki Native American roots. It was founded in 1904 and incorporated in 1975. What once felt like a small village in the middle of nowhere is now surrounded by millions of people in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Many residents live below the poverty level. Food banks have become more essential as people try to limit their outings. And in Guadalupe, we're very condensed. We have multi-generation families in one home, but we're lucky enough to have four bedrooms. So I was exposed to it uh, early on and I had to quarantine myself and I had the space to do that. But some of our families here aren't lucky enough to be able to do that. There might be eight people in a home with two bedrooms. You know, where do you send the positive case to get quarantined? There's just no, no way. So currently, Guadalupe has about four times the rate of people testing positive for COVID-19 compared to the rest of the county? Actually, those numbers were correct on the June 16th weekly numbers. However, as June 23rd last week, we were down to 2.8. But the town is taking action to reduce the infection rates, including cooperative efforts with Maricopa County, the city of Tempe, and others to provide education and assistance. That includes handing out thousands of free masks, conducting testing events in the community, and providing assistance to those who are positive. Hi, may I speak with Rosa or Mary? Guadalupe has also hired two employees known as promotoras in Spanish. They are community liaison assistants, like social workers who provide answers and resources, such as shopping for residents under quarantine. I was home, I was retired. So I came out of retirement to help out my community and see how I can be effective in combating this virus and just stop stopping the spread. Luis Sotelo and his family tested positive for COVID-19. About a week later, he started feeling the symptoms. We got a, a severe headache, a headache that wouldn't, wouldn't go away, body aches, like your whole body ached like it was getting my experience felt like I was getting crushed. And I'm like, oh my God, everything was hurting, you know? And at the same time, fatigue, weakness. It doesn't discriminate and it doesn't judge, you know? If it's gonna, it's everywhere. 
Behind me is Push Ridge, a rugged wilderness, and the southwestern tip of the Santa Catalina Mountains. Just weeks ago, it was engulfed in flames. In fact, for over a month, the Bighorn Fire burned in the Catalinas, forcing evacuations, requiring hundreds of firefighters and a steady stream of helicopters, planes, trucks, and bulldozers to control and eventually contain it. It scorched nearly 120,000 acres, much of it habitat to a vast array of wildlife, including mountain lions, deer, and a native sheep that shares the fire's name, the Bighorn. The Bighorn Fire was started by a lightning strike on Bighorn Mountain. So much time and money and effort went into restoring the Bighorn sheep to the Catalinas. We're looking at this closely. We're mapping it. We're looking for the sheep. We're trying to figure out what's going on with them. We want them to survive. We want them to flourish. As of the count last fall, we had 75. We probably have 80 or more because we had lambs on the mountain. Three lambs were observed in the mountain range since the fire began. My name is Mark Hart. I'm a public information officer for Arizona Game and Fish in Tucson. I cover all of southeastern Arizona in that role. The good news is it's been relatively slow moving and not burning with great intensity everywhere. Here in the Santa Catalina Mountains, we have desert bighorn sheep, so they're adapted to this environment, particularly the lack of water. They have been here for centuries. The herd in the Santa Catalina is numbered about 100. We know that historically and from field observations, but declined until they disappeared in the late 1990s for reasons not fully understood by scientists. Many theories have been speculated on it was not about overhunting. It may have had something to do with development. That's a species quite vulnerable to disease, particularly respiratory infections like pneumonia. There's also a school of thought that the vegetation, particularly in the Push Ridge wilderness, was just too dense for them. Bighorn sheep need clear line of sight and escape terrain. They rely on their eyesight to see predators coming. And when they need to escape, their preference is to climb, and they are excellent climbers and can climb at great speed. Is everybody ready? Yes. In 2013, we reintroduced desert bighorn sheep to the range, releasing 120 over a four-year period there. remember in particular one release right at the base of Butch Ridge in an area known as Laquachi. They went right up to the group that was already there. They got into sheepy terrain right away and knew where to go. It's a big deal to capture bighorn sheep that's done with helicopters and net guns. But we've had good luck, and by and large, most have made the arduous journey in good shape. The, the big curled horns on the rams are all about mating, and you can hear the sound of them butting heads. It sounds like a baseball on a bat, and they'll go at it for hours for, for the right to breed with the females. Young rams are ramblers. We see this a lot with the herds around the Tucson area, where the young rams who don't really have a place in the pecking order yet and aren't strong enough to defeat a more dominant ram, will take a walkabout. And they'll go from, say, the Catalinas or the Watermans to other mountain ranges. But they always come back around the time of the rut, which is August, September. And they may get some sparring rounds in with their buddies, so one day they can take their place in the pecking order.
the initial burning took place in the Bighorn Sheep Management Area, and most of that Bighorn Sheep Management Area burnt. True to what limited data we have in some field observations, they are in the area from roughly Push Ridge to below Finger Rock. They're in the extreme southwest corner of the range at relatively low elevation. They're below the fire, but not the parts of the area most used by the sheep historically, which is why we're cautiously optimistic that once the fire is over, the bighorns will make better use of that area and perhaps expand their territory. It will be cleared of dense vegetation. There will be new growth coming up and it will be perfect for them. Sprouting prickly pear, for example, is a favorite. It's like a bighorn sheep salad bar after a fire. For sure, it's going to help them deal with mountain lions. Mountain lions are all about stealth. Densely vegetated areas are good places for concealment. They are classic stalkers and will move slowly and deliberately under concealment toward their prey. Not all mountain lions eat bighorn sheep, but some do, and they're really good at getting bighorn sheep. You know, you never know, because it's wildlife, and they do what they want to do. So they're not stampeding. There's no stampede. This isn't a Disney movie. They just disperse widely. We see wildlife adapting to the fire. Yes, maybe they're not where we would expect them to be. Sometimes re-entering burned areas when it's still smoldering. A Gould's turkey over the weekend we observed doing that very thing. And it's a 155,000 acre mountain range. There's still plenty of territory out there for them and they're gonna use it. I, I think it's understandable that people are alarmed because of values at risk. We've got firefighters at risk, we've got homes at risk. But we quietly say that in most cases, wildfire is a natural process that improves the overall health of the mountain range over time. Lightning started this fire, as it did long before man inhabited Tucson. There were fires in the Catalinas and these other mountain ranges. And these animals, for generations, they've survived because it's part of a natural process. Today, we see acts of civil disobedience, mass protests calling for justice and equality. In 1942, when the U.S. government forcibly interned nearly 70,000 American citizens of Japanese descent, along with 50,000 Japanese immigrants into harsh and isolated detention camps, there were very few cries for justice. One American losing his freedom did fight for it then and for years after the war ended. Gordon Hirabayashi. Driving up the Mount Lemmon Highway, just outside of Tucson, I had seen the sign that reads, Gordon Hirabayashi, several times. It always piqued my curiosity and I finally looked up the name. I learned there was a prison camp on that spot and how Gordon Hirabayashi's story intersected with that prison. You know, I read in an article that when you first arrived at the camp, uh, that the Hopi, it was Hopi Indians um, that invited you to their Yeah, their Ramada. Yeah. They built the Ramada on the side of the hill. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know anything about that. I'm just new in the camp then. Uh, and there was a group of uh, Hopis there. And they said, well, uh, we know you guys are engaged in a white man's war, Europe and so on. Uh, we, we have no interest in fighting in your war. So they were a category of objectors that were sent to prison. At any rate, they took a real warm interest gave me a hair wash with uh, soap weeds. Mm -hmm. They brewed some tea and gave it to me and, and just treated me like a brother. Mm -hmm. 
when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, our west coast became a potential combat zone. Living in that zone were more than 100,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds of them American citizens, one-third aliens. We knew that some among them were potentially dangerous. Most were loyal. But no one knew what would happen among this concentrated population if Japanese forces should try to invade our shores. Military authorities therefore determined that all of them, citizens and aliens alike, would have to move. They expected injustice and discrimination one way or another. So when this order came, this was another thing that they had to cope with. You know, even though they felt it was totally unnecessary and totally wrong and it's a discrimination, it wasn't their first line thought to, you know, I'm going to confront this, battle it. Mm -hmm. You ever review uh, the story of Columbus? Columbus and his men came ashore, dark-skinned people hovered around with curiosity and later brought them food and so on. Columbus discovered America because they weren't humans that counted. And so uh, they're ignored. And uh, this, this viewpoint sort of psychologically continues. Gordon Hirabayashi was one of three Japanese Americans to resist being interned during World War II. He lost his 1943 Supreme Court case, Hirabayashi versus the United States, and was sent to that prison camp on Mount Lemmon. For a while, I thought the, the Constitution uh, failed me. Then it occurred to me that uh, it wasn't necessarily the Constitution that failed me. It was the people who were placed in the responsibility of upholding the Constitution. Prisoners at the camp helped build what would become the Catalina Highway. The camp was closed when the road was completed in 1951. In 1999, the area where the camp stood was renamed to honor Gordon Hirabayashi. In 2012, he was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Many museums, theater companies, and historical organizations are designed around community interaction and physical presence. For instance, people still go to plays rather than watch film or television because of the live experience. So what happens when physical distancing prevents us from gathering? Well, necessity is the mother of invention. We checked in with several of Tucson's cultural institutions to see what they've come up with to stay connected to the community. We're all about being together. It never occurred to me before that we'd have to stay away from each other. That's the whole point of live theater. In about five seconds, Cindy and I went, uh-oh, <laughs> uh-oh. We've always really embraced the whole idea of, of not recording and not processing anything that we do through electronics. Uh, but, but now... Hey everyone, I'm Christopher Pankratz and I'm the Props Master for the Rogue Theater. We've been doing a lot of backstage tours and uh, interviews with various artists that work with us. That's been a lot of fun. And I'm doing just fine. We're just getting ready to do a stop action animation of the balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet using salt and pepper shakers. Oh, that I were a glove upon that hand, that I might touch that cheek. Ay, me. You're awake. As are you. We've done that, this recording of The Awakening, which I think will be really wonderful. It's been fun to explore other means of creativity in the midst of all this. 
I'm Dr. Michael Ings. I'm co-founder of Arizona Heritage Tours. We do uh, historical cultural projects throughout town. Got shut down after the best year we've ever had in terms of the number of presentations we did as Arizona Heritage Tours in person. I can probably show you a short proof of concept that we did in collaboration with uh, the Center for Digital Humanities and the Presidio. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The term digital humanities is really where uh, those of us in the humanities will use various forms of technology to help us with our research. And in some cases, uh, that will trickle down into, uh, into our teaching. That project is a, it's an NEH, uh, National Endowment for the Humanities based uh, project. We're using something called volumetric video capture to capture 3D video of actors. And then we're able to incorporate them into the 3D version of the Presidio that we have. I'm a father and being able to use these new media outlets is going to necessarily bring the information to young people in a way that's more digestible, more engaging, more compelling. All who intend to remain in Tubac and ignore and So this, this I think, will help with uh, not only some of the race relations that we're dealing with and, and some of the misinformation, but adding to the existing information that people have so that they have a more holistic understanding of, of America, what it means to be American, and all the things that, that are wrapped up in those ideas. And we're still together talking uh, another way. It's, it's amazing how that happened to us almost seamlessly. I think it's really going to be a fun time over the next uh, couple of years. It's central to our work to think about issues of social and racial justice and they're so exposed and raw right now and and they all they always are but they're there it's just so much more pronounced at this moment. CDC has already recommended that schools don't do field trips for the upcoming school year. And a big part of our work here is outreach to schools, bringing schools um, onto the museum campus for the education program. So one of our major initiatives right now is to translate our education program into distance learning online modules. We've been talking a lot about, you know, drawing inspiration from ancestors in times of catastrophe. And one thing we did immediately after COVID hit was to create our own living archive of this moment to document how Jewish folks across Southern Arizona are experiencing this particular time of catastrophe. It's still an open call for people to submit any kind of documentation. Once we get onto the other side of COVID, even though that's a hard thing to imagine right now, we will continue to think about how can we make our public programming accessible to audiences through digital formats. Once, you know, March came around and it, it, we realized the magnitude of things, uh, we just had to, we had to cancel everything. And what that really meant was Barrio Stories Nogales. This was the biggest one so far. I got an NEA Art Town grant. But our goal is to put everything we were going to do in a street festival online. All the reasons that, that sucked before the pandemic, that was so difficult to be a nonprofit theater group, are uh, all the great uh, advantages we have now being nimble, of being light, of being able to work anywhere. Together we are stronger. Buenas tardes, buenas noches. So we went double down with, with going digital. We're not trying to do any live performances this next season. We've been experimenting with Zoom, with open broadcast system different platforms like Twitch. I'm your host for the night, Adam Cooper Teran, ensemble member with Borderlands Theater. What you looking at, man? Sarko Guerrero is a mask maker who's been doing like storytelling with masks. Happy just being able to step into our power right now. This is the moment. And, we started um, a, a poetry series called really, Lunadas you know, on the, on the new moon of every month. We're gonna keep pushing and seeing how, how far we can push that live experience through through live stream. I look at all those chairs sitting right next to each other, and and I wonder, boy, when when is that going to happen uh, again? And, and I'm I'm so looking forward to. The call of the cicada begins in the hottest, driest days of June and continues through the rains of the monsoon. So how do cicadas fit into the Sonoran ecosystem? And how do they make that loud buzzing sound? We introduce you to the Harbingers of Summer.
They're out there, they're all over the place, they're on all the trees and bushes and such, but they're very hard to find because they have what appears to be good vision. When you come up to a tree, they'll either stop calling immediately, or if they see you, sometimes they'll move their body around the tree to avoid you seeing them. Sometimes they're hard to key in on what, from their noise that they're making because it can be so loud, it's hard to tell where it's actually coming from. People mention often, like whenever they hear cicadas, they make it sound like it's hotter outside or feels hotter outside. That's usually because they're out at the hottest, driest part of the day. They start emerging in June before the monsoons hit. When the conditions are right, the um, nymphal stage, the immature stage, leaves the ground, finds a place to crawl up to, and then the adult stage emerges from that nymphal stage. And that usually happens in the evening after dark. have approximately four dozen species that occur in the state. The most common species that we encounter in our area is the Apache cicada, Diceroprocta apache, and that's the one that we hear most of the time in Tucson. They're grayish black and they have yellow markings on them. They're what we hear during the day when we hear the loud whirling buzzing sound. Only the males make the sound and they have a structure underneath called a timbre. By flexing that with muscles back and forth, it produces a sound and it's amplified by the hollowed out body cavity of the abdomen of the male. The sound is used to attract females and to compete with sound of other males. And it's also as a defensive mechanism too. Each species has its own sound, its own call, so to speak. The purpose of cicadas, as the ultimate purpose for most organisms, is to reproduce. And, but they also feed other animals too. Birds feed on them. Mammals feed on them, reptiles feed on them, and so they provide a pretty nutritious, healthy food source for other organisms. They're just another beautiful part of the biodiversity in our region. Arizona, especially southeastern Arizona, has the highest amount of insect and other arthropod diversity than any other part of the country. To me, it's kind of like the beginning of summer. I sort of look forward to hearing the first buzz that I hear. I kind of note that when it happens because for me that's kind of the uh, beginning of a season for insects to start showing up here in the desert region. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Stay safe and we'll see you next week.